Hello everyone, good afternoon. My name is Ana Carvalho and I'm here today, as usual, with my colleague Inês Almeida to present you with this month's R&D session, always powered by EDP New. For those who don't know, EDP New is the research and development center of the EDP group, and we work on European R&D projects looking at innovative solutions for the decarbonization, the smartification and flexibility of the energy sector. We have been organizing these R&D sessions actually since 2020, more or less once per month. Uh, and the aim of our sessions is to get together experts to discuss several topics regarding the future of energy, the challenges that we are facing, and also the solutions that we are already <coughs> putting into practice to revolutionize the energy sector. Hi, everyone. Please note that these webinars are recorded and the previous sessions uh, are available on our website. You just need to read uh, the, the QR code uh, on this slide and you'll be able to watch them. Also, this session uh, of today uh, will be available on our website and also on our YouTube channel in a couple of days. For today's sessions, we want to encourage you to use our Q&A chat to ask your questions to our speakers. And at the end of the session, we will have time for uh, the Q&A moments where the speakers will be able to, to answer. With no further delays, we welcome you all to this event and wish you all a great session, uh, but not without first introduce you our moderator, Miguel Chozal. Miguel is an R&D Energy Project Engineer uh, working with us uh, at EDP News Renewable Energy Sources Technology Area. He holds an MSc in Electrical and Computer Engineering from the Faculty of Engineering of University of Porto. And uh, he has previous professional experience in both the solar PV and energy retail industries. Currently, Miguel is working uh, in European funded projects related to offshore wind technologies, namely EU SCORES, uh, and also Atlantis projects, where he's coordinating the offshore robotic operations. Now, Miguel, the floor is yours. Well, thanks. So sorry, uh, thanks for the kind presentation, Inesh. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here moderating this session related to a very trendy topic. So as most of you may know, Portugal will launch a 10 gigawatt offshore wind power auction to be concluded by 2030. This will be a tremendous effort towards the country's goal of reaching 80% of electricity coming from renewable energies by 2026. However, this will also mean an equal effort to be realized uh, in the Portuguese offshore wind industry in several domains, namely in the domain of the permitting. So as of now, around 80 gigawatts of offshore rated capacity is stuck in administrative, in administrative permitting procedures. Also supply chain, so uh, namely inflation, difficulties to access raw materials and the lack of a clear project pipeline, repowering, uh, so although repowering wind farms would treble the power output and reduce the number of turbines by 25%, it would also mean it would also require a strong awareness to address site-specific constraints and also find, solution, find solutions for the decommissioned turbines. Without forgetting port access, so as of today, there is neither a port in Portugal or in the uh, Iberian Peninsula that would meet all the requirements for an immediate response to construct the proposed 10 gigawatts of installed capacity. So clear guidelines will have to be followed in these domains uh, to mitigate these risks. And also clear endeavors will have to be compelled in the R&D sector to expedite this sector growth. So to name a few, grid integration, hybridization with other renewable energy sources, hydrogen, storage, to economy, HVDC cables, and also robotization and digitalization of operation and maintenance. This last specific topic will be elaborated by one of our speakers, Andri, when he uh, presents the project Atlantis. So to address these topics, the agenda for today, we will start with Mark Walsh, the CEO of Wavec, presenting the Portuguese commitment on floating offshore wind. Then uh, Tiago Duarte uh, will present the role of R&D in floating wind. Uh, after Andri Pinto will present the H2020 project Atlantis. Um, uh, so a new era for robotics-based operation and maintenance. 
And then to finalize, we will have a Q&A between our audience and our speakers. So without further ado, uh, Marco is currently the Chief Executive Officer of Wavec Offshore Renewables, having previously held the position of Chief Innovation Officer at Collab Plus Atlantic. Mark holds key expertise in several scientific fields, including fluid dynamics, coastal engineering, control systems, numerical modeling, and data science. His track record has been mostly focused on marine renewables, a field in which he has wide experience in providing technical and strategic support to technology developers. Marco has both a PhD and an MSc in mechanical engineering, and also an MSc in management and strategy. So Marco, first of all, thanks for accepting our invite, and the floor is yours. Well, before sharing, just say um, uh, thanks to, to EDP New. Is is of is as always a pleasure to participate in this type of event. Um, it's not the first time, so I can. I've been here before. Let me just find my presentation. Is here. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Mark. Yes. I, I I'm just putting it in the. Uh, display mode. Is OK? Can you see it properly? Yes. OK, very good. So, um, well, uh, my name is Marco Alves. Uh, Miguel told, told you uh, already this. I'm the CEO of Wayback uh, Offshore Renewables. Uh, but uh, to some extent, I'm still landing because I, I, I just took this uh, role uh, a few months ago. Um, and, uh, and my plan is to split this presentation into parts. The first one is basically to present you the what uh, what Wavec is, just Wavec at a glance, really just no more than one minute, and then uh, focus the rest of the, the presentation in this Portuguese commitment on the development, of, uh, not exactly development, a bit more than that, implementation of offshore uh, floating wind. So about Wavec, basically Wavec is an institution that has about 20 years experience in offshore renewables, not only uh, floating wind or bottom fixed wind, but also wave energy, tidal and uh, other forms of energy. The institution is essentially split in, in three, in, in three uh, areas or pillars. The first one is economy. Uh, the second is marine environment and licensing and, and then um, uh, engineering operation, and we are looking into all the, the sectors that we see below. Offshore wind is basically where we put, uh, I don't know, 80% of our activity nowadays for the, for the evolution of the, of the industry. Also wave energy, floating solar, uh, green hydrogen connected to offshore renewables. Uh, offshore aquaculture also in connection to offshore renewables, so offshore renewables producing energy not to uh, not a, a, at a utility scale, but also for local applications like offshore aquaculture. Uh, the CO2 uh, capture and the, the, this balance of CO2 uh, uh, emissions. Uh, and and recently we start looking as an additional business model or a potential business model to be coupled to offshore renewables uh, that is uh, water desalination. We are not really concerned nowadays about water desalination. Well, it is it is already some kind of concern, but we anticipate that uh, in 10, 15 years, it will be a, a huge concern in and con concern on, on, on society in general. So we are basically preparing this future, looking into potential different business models, coupling the renewable sector with uh, with uh, water desalination activities. On the economic side, what people do, what this team do mostly is techno-economic assessment, but also site selection and resource assessment, this type of uh, activities. On the marine environmental and licensing team, the focus nowadays is the licensing, permitting and consenting because we have been approached by many, many promoters that are looking into Portugal with, with an eye on these 10 gigas that was mentioned before. 
but uh, other activities like uh, life cycle assessment and, and marine biology, ecology, uh, and acoustics. We have a, a very strong team on, 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 on assessing the impact of uh, uh, acoustics on, on uh, ecosystems. And then the engineering, the engineering and operation teams is really focused on performance and monitoring and data analytics. So getting data and extract information from this data. Also offshore operations, logis the, the, the optimization of offshore operations, uh, O&M and logistics. And also a bit on, more on the numerical side, the dynamics, the response of umbilicals of the structure itself, estimations of the power production, and at the end of the day, the, some kind of uh, uh, capacity to optimize or to define an, op an, an optimal approach for the farm layout. So basically, in a, in a, in a very briefly, this is Wavec. We are spread. Um, I may, I may say almost all around the world. So this is basically uh, our clients in 15 different countries. Uh, on the research um, area, we have been also deeply involved in many, many uh, European projects, some of them um, with, uh, with EDPicnet. This is, 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 is a pleasure to collaborate. Um, so this is all, all these small logos are basically different projects we have been involved from 2004 till uh, today. So it's quite a lot, uh, uh, quite significant involvement. So this is basically to present you Wavec. And now I would like, with no more delays, looking into this Portuguese commitment on the floating wind. And this, this, this uh, is basically summarized by this picture. So what is the, the, the commitment? The commitment is basically to achieve 10 gigas of install capacity by 2030 is a, a huge ambition. And we will explain later why it's so huge. But basically, this is the, the this is the plan. All the red areas you see here defined were uh, were defined to deploy uh, two gigas in Viana do Castelo, 1.5 in Leixões, four gigas in Figueira da Foz, Ericeira, Sindra, Cascais, one giga, and then Sines, 1.5 gigas. So th these are basically the areas that will be reshaped after the public consultation. Um, so we will need to take into account mm, the opposition for local communities, for instance. So we, we, we don't. We, it is impossible to deny that 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 will be some some opposition that will lead to some kind of reshaping of, of these areas. Is the common approach? Um, no worries on that. The first step was was taken already, and it consists in four uh, uh, lots to tender with a capacity of five, uh, 500 megawatts, each one of them. One will be in Viana do Castelo, two in Figueira da Foz, and one to be confirmed in Sines. So the, the first two gigas of these 10 gigas will be uh, tendered uh, till the end of this year, according to the, the our government. So this is basically to summarize the 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 commitment, the Portuguese commitment on on floating wind. Let me just say that you can see in this figure some blue parts, and the blue parts is bottom fixed wind, which is residual uh, in our in the in the Portuguese strategy for one simple reason: the 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 bathymetry goes deep really fast in Portugal, so uh, there's just one or two areas that allow some kind of uh, uh, some deployment on 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 uh, on uh, bottom fixed wind just is is residual if we compare this capacity to the floating wind capacity that uh, we have in our uh, coast. These ten gigas brings a lot of uh, of uh, challenges, so we have a plenty uh, of different challenges that we we can organize by infrastructure the manufacture and assembly, environmental impact, site characterization, public acceptance and, and, and support mechanisms or poli policy support mechanisms on, on the policy side of these of these things. So on the infrastructure, of course, there's 
plenty of challenges that we'll need to face. Por uh, ports and logistics, the 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 the, the vessels, the, the offshore substations and vessels includes uh, SOV, CTVs, cable layers, a lot of different types of uh, of vessels. Of course, this this is a challenge. This is critical to achieve these 10 gigas. Uh, and of course, we'll we'll need to respond, or the industry needs to respond in a proper way on the on the the re readjusting or reshaping our infrastructure capacity. On the manufacturing and assembly, we need to take into account that this will be critical also for the supply of wind turbines because mostly Portugal is not alone. There's a lot of different countries with similar uh, similar plans for the offshore industry. So this will put pressure on the on the on the on on uh, turbine manufacturers. And of course, this will this this must be solved uh, must be solved in 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 a proper way. Also, the supply of steel and raw materials will be also critical. So all these things must be uh, considered. Probably introducing in the platforms different materials like concrete or uh, well, just to just to to share with you some some uh, some thoughts on the environmental impact. Uh, we don't know what will be the impact. We, we have a lot of studies, a lot of uh, estimates on the on the impact on marine ecosystems, but we never know. So there's a lot of uh, monitor monitoring activities that will need to take place in order to see what what is happening, what really is happening in the in the in the marine ecosystems. Uh, the same for bird collisions. Is uh, is this a a problem or not so the monitoring will tell us the uh, uh, the level of uh, uh, the, 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 the how big these issues are or not visual uh, uh, visual impacts so all these type of things are things that we need to take into account to account in a proper way to establish um, mitigation strategies that allow us to uh, scale up the industry without uh, uh, significant environmental impacts. So on the site characterization, and here is more on the on the on reducing the risk of of developers, because it is is critical to to know exactly what the site is in terms of resource characterization, wind, waves, currents, etc. The geotechnical and geophysics. This characterization is also critical. Is 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 really is really important for the country to have this type of knowledge about our coast in order to uh, share this knowledge with the potential promoters that will will use this data to mitigate the 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 risk on the on the investments on the public acceptance of course there there will be some kind of conflicts uh, is is a bit naive to think on a, on on a, on a, on, a, on, a, on a development of this scale without conflicts. There there will be conflicts for sure with the navigation, with the fishing industries, and those conflicts must be also mitigated. Um, other type of conflicts due to the noise, uh, due to the property values, etc. There's plenty of. Uh, of uh, potential conflicts that we can we can think of. Of course, we need to to take a position here that we we know that those conflicts are possible, but we also know that we will be able to mitigate those conflicts, involving the fishing industry in activities for in, for the offshore uh, uh, wind industry, involving local communities. The, there must be, and there will be for sure, some kind of uh, potential involvement of local communities in order to reduce this, 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 uh, the, the, in order to improve the public acceptance on the policy policy support mechanisms. There's no, is too, is to some extent, is too soon to talk about it because everything depends on the auction uh, framework, on the rules. As soon as the rules are clear on top of the table, of course, there will be plenty of space for discussion and to adjust and to put what I believe that is really important is to have those rules, 
the auction framework really clear for everybody. So everybody needs to understand exactly why the rules are those are not other rules uh, in order to uh, promote some kind of transparency. OK, this is basically to give you uh, I don't see the point to go step by step on each one of these challenges, but uh, just to give you an impression that there's uh, plenty of uh, challenges to to respond to solve. Uh, but this, this is not a, a negative view on the process. On the opposite, all these challenges uh, they, uh, mean 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 opportunities. So this is basically to to define the area of opportunities in this in this uh, regard. OK, so plenty of uh, opportunities for our industry and uh, it will be it will be really good if the industry can can take advantage of all these opportunities. If we manage to take these these advantages, if we manage to solve these issues, of course, we will improve the cost effectiveness of the, the industry and this is critical. So uh, more or less. The, the LCOE of uh, floating wind is nowadays 140 euros per megawatt hour, and it will be nice to reach values about 50 euros per megawatt hour in uh, 2030, or, uh, or uh, it will be even better if you can reduce more this, 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 this value, LCOE value. For that, of course, all these challenges must be solved. We need to tackle this challenge in a very proper way in order to improve the cost effectiveness of this industry. OK, so now what what uh, what I think that is important and I've been talking about this, the, the about offshore wind and, uh, and, and nowadays about Portugal and the, the and the challenges and the ambition of Portugal in many, many different places. And what I realize is that the people that they, they don't have exactly the 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 to some extent what 10 gigas means in terms of uh, well 10 gigas or 11 or 20 or 100 megas uh, at, the, uh, at the end of the day is a bit the same so what we uh, thought that could be helpful for for people to understand exactly exactly what we are talking about was basically to break down the 10 gigas into six six aspects one is the annual power production, the annual inv investment that must be considered for, for this ambition, the number of turbines that the, 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 the 10 gigas uh, will imply, the job creation, the, the CO2 equivalent emissions that will be avoided, and the annual outflow of foreign exchange. So if we look into these six that are very easy for people to understand what we are talking about. If we look into these aspects, we will realize that I can put the, the entire slide um, here because it's easier to present. We are talking about 35 terawatt hours a year. This is no, more or less 75% of the annual electricity consumption in the country. OK, 75%. So we are talking about a new new horizon, a new paradigm of uh, electricity production and electricity consumption in Portugal. Of course, not all the energy will be to produce electricity, but just to give you an order of magnitude of the, 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 the values that we are talking about. On the annual investment, we are talking about 5 billion euros, which, is, which represents almost 80% of the annual direct foreign investment in the country. OK, number of turbines, if you consider that the turbines that we will have in a few years, the, 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 the floating turbines that we will have are about 15 megawatts, uh, the, the, the rated power, we are here talking about uh, 650 units, which is just to give you an idea, the cumulative, in fact, this number is not the correct one. Um, I'm sorry about it. The cumulative deployment of offshore turbines in 2023 is about uh, 11,000, not se not uh, uh, 7,000. Okay, but anyway, just to to uh, again, it's another uh, to give you uh, uh, an image of the dimension on the job crea creation. And this study was based on uh, on bottom fixed. So we assume that the floating wind will be similar to bottom fixed with probably uh, a bit more job creation. 
So we are talking about 95,000 direct jobs for, to reach 10 gigas, which represent 165 of the total jobs on the electricity, gas and water sector in Portugal. And if we take into account the uh, uh, indirect jobs, we need to multiply this value by two. So we, uh, overall, we are talking about 200,000 jobs for this new sector, okay? On the green gas uh, emissions avoided, we are talking about 16 million tons of CO2 equivalent per year that, that won't be uh, emitted to the atmosphere. This represents uh, one third, more or less, of the total uh, green gas emissions of Portugal in 2020. Okay. And if you are looking into the annual outflow of foreign exchange, and here the imports of natural gas is basically the critical factor to produce about uh, 20 uh, terawatts hour per year of energy between 15 and 20. So we will um, will be able to reduce our invoice, let's say, in 2 billion euros which represents basically 25% of the annual debt service uh, of Portugal. So just to conclude, um, I think when we look into the, the 10 gigas, when we look into the, the ambition, we, we really need to break down this ambition in this type of numbers to understand exactly what the what will be the impact that we are talking about what will be the impact for the country in order to and i, I think if we do it if we manage to do it we will realize easily that we are talking about a new paradigm we are talking about a new reality that port the portugal the, the, the country or the portugal is facing and uh, of course i hope uh with with uh, with success so this is basically my presentation. Sorry, I think I took a bit more time than I expect, but uh, thanks a lot uh, for, for, for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, thank you, uh, Marco, for your very fruitful presentation where you highlighted several stuff, uh, so to name a few, the, the specific locations of both bottom fixed and uh, floating offshore, um, the main challenges we have to overcome and also the impact that, that, will have, that they will have to our country. So next up, we have Tiago Duarte from Ocean Wind. So Tiago Duarte is the head of the floating wind engineering team at Ocean Winds supporting projects under operation, constructions, and development stage. Previously, he was installation manager of the Wind Float Atlantic project, the first pre-commercial wind farm of the coast of Portugal. He has over 10 years experience in floating wind, from research and modeling, engineering and design, to project and installation management. Tiago holds a master in mechanical engineering. So Tiago, thanks a lot for accepting our invite, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, let me share my screen. Good. So I believe you are seeing my, my presentation today. Yes. Good. Um, so uh, today I was challenged to to give a bit of a background on, on this role of R&D in floating wind. Um, and we have um, quite a bit of story to tell, I believe, in the wind in this field and particularly within Portugal. I'll start my presentation just briefly to present uh, Ocean Winds and we are who we are. Um, we Ocean Winds is a joint venture between uh, uh, EDP Renewables and NG. We were created in 2020. Uh, both companies were already collaborating together in a lot of uh, offshore wind projects, and Ocean Wind was born as the sole vehicle for investment in this area from both sponsors. Um, we believe that it's a field that it's quite intensive and collaborating together within Ocean Winds gives us critical mass to address the challenges of this industry. So what do we do? Uh, we develop uh, offshore wind projects, um, but not only. We finance them, we build them, and we operate the, the wind farms. We are not here just to, to create new, new projects. We are here for the long run. Uh, and to gain maximum value from, from the operations 
of our wind farms. I think uh, the next slide covers a bit our global footprint. Um, in the last three years, uh, Ocean Winds has been able to secure 16.6 uh, .6 gigawatts of growth uh, capacity uh, through our projects. Um, since we are talking about Portugal and focusing on floating wind, uh, this already represents about a third of our portfolio, which is quite significant in the big scheme of things and covers projects from different geographies from all the way from Korea, where we have uh, our most advanced uh, commercial project with 1.2 gigas of floating wind capacity to obviously Europe uh, with a strong focus on in the UK, but also in Portugal, obviously in France, where we have one wind farm under operation and one wind farm under construction uh, today. And also, we were also awarded in the US, in particular the West Coast Golden State Wind with up to two gigawatts of capacity. So obviously this gives us uh, quite a big momentum, and uh, but we, we will continue to expand this portfolio and we are quite actively uh, pursuing other tenders across uh, the globe. And now focusing into the topic that brought me here today, um, how does floating wind um, and R&D are related and how how this story came together uh, to reach this this point where we are looking into 10 gigawatts capacity already uh, for Portugal. This slide is a, is a quite old one. Um, I believe we are, it has been around within our computers for for the last uh, many years, uh, but it really justifies why uh, offshore wind and why floating wind. Um, ADP in particular, uh, where, where my previous experience was, when we looked into um, where to expand, uh, offshore was obviously the next frontier. And if we look at the bathymetry maps, we're all aware that uh, shallow waters are a bit restricted to the North Sea and deep water potential is, is very significantly. So in particular for, for the 10 gigawatt case of Portugal, we do know that there's at least one or two areas where fixed bottom foundations are being proposed but the majority of the capacity lies in deeper waters where floating uh, substructures are really the base. So this, this was something that, uh, that was realized quite a long time ago where no technical solution was, was possible. And this then pro in, 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 in entitled us to, to go forward and look for an R&D and technical solutions that could be feasible. So where, where do we get this inspiration? Well, Floating wind technology is, is it looked into adjacent sectors. Uh, obviously, we knew how wind turbines work thanks to our experience in, in onshore and how um, these have, have been expanded to offshore. But for the floating foundations, uh, the other market or the other industry that knew how to do this was the oil and gas industry. And here we see very, a variety of concepts from semi-submersible, spars and tension like platforms coexisting in the market in different regions of the globe. So I won't spend too, too much detail in, in the pros and cons of each one. Uh, from our side, we, we have weighted uh, semi-submersible concepts as the most um, feasible for the markets that we, that we were interested in, in addressing, in particular thanks to, to their modular designs and high stability behavior, um, allowing us to, to do risky operations and performing a lot of, of, of these operations on the key side. Uh, the industry somehow proved us right. Uh, when we look at, uh, at the amount of concepts and the development and, and being studied, more than half um, of them are semi-submersible concepts. And this gives us some reassurance that, uh, that we are not so far off. So over the last 15 years, uh, we have been involved in, in offshore wind. Um, back in 2008, uh, we were introduced by the, by the end of WAVEC, who already at the time pointed to us as marine renewables um, roadmap for Portugal, where the floating wind pop up as a, as a very important uh, opportunity, and in particular a concept from principal power called the wind float. From 2008, uh, we signed an agreement with the principal power in 2009, and we were successfully deployed the, the prototype uh, two years later. So this was a quite um, quite good milestone for us. Really proud of the team there uh, back in the days to be able to deploy the prototype in such short timeline. We operated Windfold One uh, for five years, its design lifetime, and we decommissioned it in 2016. 
uh, having successfully achieved the objectives of the project. In parallel, and since, particularly since 2013, 2014, we started developing the next stage already. Uh, having validated the technology, uh, we moved to a pre-commercial project. Uh, we call it pre-commercial not to demonstrate the technology, but to be able to scale it up and demonstrate the bankability of, of the technology. Windfoot Atlantic um, is comprised of, of three units installed off the coast of Vienna do Castelo, not far from one of the areas proposed now by, by the Portuguese government for this auction. And we believe it's a, it's a very flagship project for the industry. The project uh, comprises three units with uh, 8.3 megawatts uh, using the principal power technology uh, semi-submersible, and it has been commissioned uh, in 2020, and it has been in operation since then. In parallel with that, we pursue we continue our efforts, in particular in France, um, with the FGL project. Uh, it has been granted one of the one of the sites uh, for the four uh, pilot projects, uh, pre-commercial projects in in France, and it's currently under construction to be in operation next year. Uh, it's obviously we are not the only ones here, um, and in fact, it's uh, it's important to highlight other projects that have been in parallel with with the uh, ocean greens efforts developing and proving this industry in particular the high wind and uh, and our colleagues from equinor have been quite active in this field as well with the first prototype deployed in 2009 and already the the second pre-commercial uh, or wind farm being deployed high wind tampon we also acknowledge the the ideal prototypes and also the the kinkerline a uh, pre-commercial wind farm with 50 megawatts installed off the coast of Scotland. Um, on this slide, it's missing all the other single unit uh, prototypes, and in particular, the ones installed in Asia and, and, and in particular in Japan in Fukushima from the Fukushima project. So all these efforts lead us to a very comfortable position in knowing the technology, um, but also uh, in showcasing it to, to our lenders. Um, as I mentioned before, the pre-commercial projects of Infot Atlantic and EFGL, um, their primary focus is to prove the bankability of the technology and the fact that we can finance in these projects. Winfoot Atlantic was the first one achieving non-recourse finance through EIB, and we replicated this model at EFGL with commercial banks, which is the next front, which was the next frontier for us. At the bottom of the slide, however, um, I highlighted two projects that run in parallel uh, with the, with this story. Many others were, were supporting us for sure, but in particular for the wind float one, uh, we had an HD 2020 project called the demo float, which monitored and uh, provided some guidance on the operation of the wind float one prototype and supported us in making sure and taking the technology for the next step. Obviously, Windfold Atlantic is supported by the NR300 funding, and it was crucial to be able to finance uh, a, a three-unit wind farm uh, like, like this one. So these two projects um, and the power requirements will pu push this technology to, to pre-commercial stage, but it's a stepping stone for the upcoming projects. I will highlight four um, challenges here that I believe we, we are still tackling and R&D is still going to support us in achieving this, these goals. In terms of project lifetime, uh, our prototype was, was designed for five years, as I mentioned, to prove the, the viability of the technology. However, our pre-commercial projects are already designed for 25 years. And we see this number being pushed even further for, for commercial projects. In terms of the turbine size, this is probably one of the biggest challenges of the industry right now. Um, I remember back in, in the prototype stage, um, looking into five megawatt turbines as, as really the norm. These days we are looking into 15 megawatt class and, and actually much larger rotor diameters. And um, if we compare this with our latest experience with the pre-commercial projects, we are talking almost about doubling the capacity of our units in Vienna. In terms of onshore works, um, we also see quite a, a lot of evolution, a, a lot driven by the turbine size. We started installing a very simple turbine, a very small turbine in the dry dock of Lijnav for the prototype. For the pre-commercial, we already had to move to a, pre to a key site to be able to do it. For commercial projects, we are studying not only key site installation, as which remains probably our best guess, but 
but also in port and offshore installations that have been proposed in a lot of R&D projects. And finally, for offshore works, we have um, also evolved quite a lot here. Uh, we see uh, in our prototype was a very simple uh, connection, chain connection with, with typical chain stoppers. For the Opry commercial, we have uh, developed uh, a lot of technologies within the mooring line connectors, the iTube connector from principal power that allows us not only to, to minimize offshore works by being able to rapidly connect the mooring lines, but also gives us the opportunity to tow back to shore and leave the turbines, the, the remaining turbines operating on site. For commercial projects, we see a lot of upcoming innovations within the within this field, especially around mooring lines within and with load reduction devices for the mooring systems, new type of connectors, and new strategies for connecting the cables um, to the to the floating units. So for, for this future class of turbines, uh, we see quite a, a big need for, for R&D. Um, we still need, uh, we, we are doubling the turbine size again, as I mentioned before. We do expect still to achieve additional savings in steel and other materials, concrete and floater weight in general. Um, obviously, with all these learnings, we do expect to see the technology further maturing. And there will be definitely further structural optimizations and interface improvements into the into the technology itself ocean uh, ocean winds is part of a, a lot of uh, um, in ocean, innovative uh, initiatives uh, across europe and the us in particular but also have internal innovation projects that focus on on these topics so in conclusions just to to highlight key takeaways from from today's lecture we we have over 15 years of floating wind industry um, in, in not only for motion winds, but all, all, all of the industry in general. And we have gone from single units deployed in, in uh, with two megawatt uh, turbines to expectations of very, uh, of very auctions uh, across the globe with multi gigawatt projects. Technology development has only been possible through R&D initiatives through these years, de-risking the technology, but but especially proving the bankability of the technology. Portugal, and being Portuguese, I'm very proud of this, has been a very important hub for this technology development, hosting flagship projects. And Ocean Winds, as Ocean Winds, we bear the experience, but also we bear the responsibility to be able to deliver competitive floating wind renewable projects, and in particular, supporting Portugal in achieving this 10 gigawatt target. So I'll, I'll stop here and um, happy to receive any questions. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you, Tiago, uh, for your very fruitful presentation, where you highlighted the role of R&D to overcome these different challenges in floating offshore wind. So next up, uh, we will have Andri. Andri is an assistant professor at the Faculty of Engineering of the University of Porto and also a senior researcher at Inesc Tech. He has concluded the doctoral program of electrical and computer engineering from the Faculty of Engineering of the University of Port in 2014. He is the principal investigator of many robotics based O&M projects financed by both national and European funds. His research has numerous publications in top ranked journals impact in areas related with mobile robotics, autonomous systems, artificial intelligence, multimodal perception, information fusion, and underwater imaging. Currently, Andrew is coordinating the Atlantis project, which has established a large-scale a large scale pilot infrastructure for demonstrating key enabling robotic technologies for operation and maintenance. So, Andrew, uh, thanks a lot for accepting our invite, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Miguel. And uh, before starting my presentation, I would like to, to share to, uh, two words with uh, uh, with you, in particular with uh, the new uh, team. Um, first, congratulations for this initiative, and second, um, th uh, congratulations for the amazing work that you are doing. Uh, I have been the pleasure to work side by side with uh, many new members. 
and uh, uh, your work is is being uh, remarkable. So, jumping to to the presentation. Um, so, um, regarding regarding the Atlantis project, which is the main topic for me to be here today. Well, the Atlantis project is a H2020 initiative that includes relevant stakeholders from uh, robotics, offshore wind energy and maritime industry. We have 10 partner, partners from six European countries that are working together to develop an ecosystem that will foster the rollout of robotics and AI technology. So this project is being led by Ineshtech with uh, a major involvement of uh, EDP New. Um, to achieve the COP26 targets, um, countries need to encourage investments in renewables energies and accelerate the phasing out of the coal. Uh, this is not an easy task since uh, the continued growth in um, offshore wind is dependent on three main factors, effective policies and licenses, um, the technological advances uh, and obviously cost reductions in operation and maintenance. Well, I will address the, these last two points in more details, for instance. Uh, O&M uh, activity accounts for up to 25% of the total life cycle cost of an offshore wind farm, which is related to turbine downtime, managing vessels, personnel, hazards, uh, weather conditions and sea state. Um, in this context, um, it is um, crucial um, or there is a crucial need to reduce the human presence from the offshore environment to minimize the exposure of the human workforce to dangerous weather conditions and sustained. Well, nearly 80 to 90 percent of the operational costs for inspection, maintenance and repair are related to transferring people from shore to the farm. With the rapid expansion of offshore wind projects uh, worldwide, the demand for skilled workers in specialized fields has increased exponentially. The scarcity of uh, qualified candidates is posing currently a, a risk to the effective operation and maintenance of offshore wind farms. Uh, for instance, considering the uh, United Kingdom case alone, the country currently faces a shortfall of 20,000 uh, engineering graduates each year just to ensure that the country reaches the net zero by 2050. Um, the, um, as the offshore wind farms continue to expand in size, complexity, uh, robotics and AI powered solutions will play an increasingly critical role uh, in ensuring efficient, reliable and safe uh, operation and maintenance. While the hardware for autonomous robotic based operations already exist, for instance, uh, drones are being equipped uh, with advanced cameras, sensors, navigation systems, uh, which allow them uh, to capture high resolution images and collect data on the condition of the turbine blades, nacelles and other um, critical uh, components. Even remotely operated vehicles, uh, ROVs, uh, are being also equipped with cameras and manipulators arms that can inspect and repair small subsea structures. Uh, set, um, such, for instance, uh, foundations and cables, uh, even without the need for uh, deploying human divers. Uh, a however, a significant investment in research and development is still needed in areas such as uh, system integration, information fusion, cybersecurity, and decision making algorithms. Enabling this autonomy as a service re represents a major bottleneck in the deployment of robotic platforms, since there is no framework um, in place that ensures that these platforms are safe to use throughout their life cycle. Uh, there are two enablers for the trusted autonomous uh, systems. First, the uh, robot must be um, must overcome unforeseen challenges and events to make all the decisions on board and to operate beyond visual line of sight. And second, the, the robots must follow a set of rules which ensure safety and self-certification. Well, that's where uh, Atlantis project adds an enormous value. It provides a test facility and services for uh, 
contributing to a seamless progression of robotic prototypes along the TR level range. Uh, it develops uh, a new robotic platforms and autonomous driving features to improve the preservation of human life and safety. And finally, it enhances the operation and perception capabilities of maritime uh, robots to make them more suitable to operate in critical conditions at offshore wind farms, which are needed to reduce maintenance costs and to avoid catastrophic failures. The project already uh, established a pioneer infrastructure that is particularly interesting for robotic developers whose goal is to uh, demonstrate the added value of technology for end users or project owners. In this way, uh, we can see that the Atlantis Test Center is being formed by a coastal test bed and the offshore test bed. Regarding the coastal test bed, which aims to uh, organize close to shore testing campaigns for de-risking robotic technologies, uh, I would say through rigorous, cost-efficient and staged testing programs performed in near real environment. Uh, on the contrary, the offshore test bed encompasses dedicated positions in the wind float Atlantic uh, that uh, will be used for demonstrating robotic technolo technologies that have reached the readiness for operating in real world environment. Uh, I have here a, a small video about the coastal test bed that is available on the web, so uh, I will uh, just skip it. Um, everyone can see this this video in 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 the web. Um, regarding the coastal test bed, um, I would say that it is like a playground for robots. We have physical infrastructure that can be used to organize testing campaigns in order to evolve the robotic platforms to the risk technology and even for tr uh, training the personnel. This is our supervisory control center that can be used to monitor the activities in both coastal and offshore test beds. And uh, we also have available supporting vessels specialized in deploying robotic technology in the sea. These resources are being used, for instance, during the demonstrations at the wind float Atlantic. Well, the Atlantis Test Center makes possible to evaluate the performance of prototypes and to support the upskilling and ret retraining programs that will play a vital role in helping workers transition into new roles. Um, some validations campaigns uh, were already organized at the coastal test bed last year. Uh, we have evaluated the performance of multiple robotic platforms for different domains. Nowadays, um, we are finalizing the preparations to go offshore, uh, in particular to wind float Atlantic for testing many, many robots, for instance, uh, underwater vehicles for cleaning and uh, inspecting. Um, these robots will have different levels of autonomy, some of them will be op remotely operated. Some of the, uh, uh, the others will be fully autonomous. Uh, we will we will also um, will demonstrate aerial vehicles for structural assessment and visual inspections. And finally, we will uh, demonstrate surface vehicles for foundation assessment and integrity monitoring of the splashing zone. Well. This is the topic that, uh, or the other topic that uh, is 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 the main subject for 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 today's presentations. Uh, the Portugal has currently a very ambitious plan, the 10 gigawatts for offshore wind production. Uh, well, we know that this this uh, this very ambitious plan imposes many technical, socio-economical challenges, and the country really needs to think globally to face all these challenges in a very useful time. Uh, such an endeavor will create an enormous stress for o &M activities. This is a double-edged knife. Uh, from one side, uh, we will have the rise of prices for o &M service providers, um, which we are expecting since the demand will increase. From the other side, uh, this is an opportunity especially for local operators and for the establishment of a national workforce specialized in robotics-based O&M. 
future project owners and the technology developers need to start working on this topic with urgency. Um, robotic technology really needs a proficient workers since no autonomous robots are allowed at the offshore wind farms. The Atlantis Test Center is ready to support this national initiative by enabling uh, real-world demonstrations of technology for all institutions. For instance, small medium enterprises and startup companies can easily access to the Atlantis Test Center services, and obviously new players can gain credibility more easy since technology can be de-risked in um, safer conditions. Uh, so I, I conclude my, my presentation. Thank you once again for this nice uh, opportunity to be here. Thank you for your great presentation, Andre, where you highlighted the role of Atlantis project in um, the robotization and optimization of operation and maintenance procedures. So now we move to the, the Q&A part. So uh, the first question, we have a question from João Maciel to, to Marco. And the question is, assuming the tender will include a beauty contest, what do you think will be the key innovation avenues, employment, value chain, et cetera, that the Portuguese state will value the most? Uh, <clears throat> uh, this is this is this is a difficult one because I don't know uh, what I think. Uh, what is my conviction that the the the, the, the government will will see as a big uh, benefit benefit for the country is basically the the positioning and the value chain. Because uh, if the, if Portugal is well positioned positioned in the value chain, it means that a lot of jobs will be created, a lot of the impact on the economy will be achieved, uh, a lot of innovation will be will be will be considered in order to develop new products, new services. Um, well. All these 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 aspects must be uh, considered. So if I if I need to choose, I really believe that the bet will be on on developing on positioning Portugal on on really well on the on the value chain. But uh, again, uh, it's not my decision, right? <laughs> um, so. But but to be to be honest, I I'm convinced that this will be the case. In, otherwise, it will be really difficult to have a huge uh, socio-economic impact on uh, in Portugal. We can exploit, we can create farms uh, of ten gigas or even more. But at the end of the day, the involvement of the the the, the, the national uh, economy will be quite uh, small. And I think there's no government that desires one 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 thing like this. Okay. Uh, thanks, Marco. So uh, next up, we have a question from another English to Tiago. And the question is, uh, what are the use cases leveraging digital technologies, IoT, big data, AI, machine learning, digital twins, and drones, with largest impact on business benefits and operations? Um, thank you for the question. Um, obviously, uh, O&M is, is being going to benefit uh, a lot from, from these innovative uh, technologies, in particular for um, uh, digital twin technologies, be able to predictive maintenance um, and, be, and be able also to anticipate failure to condition, in, to condition based monitoring systems. And we we are developing this. Um, it's um, it's hard to to distinguish between all these technologies uh, as uh, the complex behavior of the floater requires uh, a lot of data to to do it as a black box. Um, but we do prefer to have a bit more great type of modeling, uh, including some some knowledge of over the foundation behavior. Um, but besides ONM, which which the, somehow seems to be the the obvious uh, study case. 
Uh, we also see applications with some interest on the on the modeling side, in particular for energy resource assessments, but also potentially even on on some applications on design um, to to use as optimization problems. Okay, thanks, Tiago. Um, so to finalize, we have a question uh, for Andre from Jean Andre. Uh, Jean -Andre. So it is known that O&M costs are high for offshore wind farms and compound into higher energy prices for the consumer. Automation of, so, of some O&M helps, of course, but maintenance is always necessary. So there's a cap to how much can be saved with automation. I am curious, I am curious with what is the obsolescence rate of the technology used for these wind farms. Are there any studies on this? Sorry, Miguel, what is, uh, can you, uh, what is the last uh, part? Uh, I miss uh, you. He's, he's asking uh, that he's, he's saying that he's curious with what is the obsolescence rate of the technology used for these wind farms, if there are any studies on this. Obsolescence, uh, I'm not understanding the word, sorry. Okay. So we can move to, to another question probably. No, I can, I can, I can say some some words about that. Uh, well, uh, the 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 obviously the robotics has a, a, a huge role, mostly um, regarding the, the inspection. This is um, when we say robotics and AI, we need to divide two things. One is uh, the uh, remotely operated vehicles. Okay, the ones where the 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 human operators. Uh, in fact, use the robots as mere tools, like a, a screwdriver, and and the others is uh, the, the autonomy. Okay, when we leverage the autonomy of uh, a robot or a drone, um, the the role of the worker um, will shift. Okay, uh, the the robot will be like a, a collaborator of 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 the human operator. I would say that um, for the inspection. Uh, we are on the edge of the autonomy, but not in the repair and maintenance. OK, the repair and maintenance uh, require specialized, uh, I would say, um, tasks that are very difficult, at least for the next uh, years, for a robot to 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 perform uh, with uh, with a similar performance as uh, a human technician. OK. Um this is this is so I do not believe that um, we will have uh, a significant impact in terms of robotics for uh, uh, repair and uh, for maintenance in two or three years. OK, uh, I believe that that role will be kept uh, for human human technicians. OK, thanks, Sandri, uh, for your answer. So uh, I would like to thank both the, the speakers and the audience for this great r and session and to pass the word to my colleagues Anna and Inesh. Thank you. OK, everyone, thank you, Miguel. Thank you to the speakers. We have just reached the end of our event. And actually, this is the last r and session before the summer vacation. So thank you very much for your active participation. This was a super interesting, super engaged session with lots of questions. We would actually like to ask our speakers to answer uh, all the questions that we had in the chat, if you will be so kind. Um, and yeah, the R&D sessions will return in September with more interesting topics and always powered by EDP New. So enjoy your afternoon and see you in September. Thank you.